Chapter Five of the Duke of Chimney Butte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Duke of Chimney Butte by G. W. Ogden. Chapter Five. Feet upon the road. I always thought I'd go out west, but somehow I never got around to it. Tatterleg said, "How far do you aim to go, Duke?" Far as the notion takes me, I guess. It was about a month after the race that this talk between Tatterleg and Duke took place, on a calm afternoon in a camp far from the site of that one into which the peddler of cutlery had trundled his disabled bicycle a year before. The Duke had put off his calfskin vest, the weather being too hot for it. Even Tatterleg had made sacrifices to appearance in favor of comfort, his piratical corduroys being replaced by overalls. The Duke had quit his job, moved by the desire to travel on and see the world, he said. He said no word to any man about the motive behind that desire, very naturally, for he was not the kind of man who opened the door of his heart. But to himself he confessed the hunger for an unknown face, for the lure of an onward beckoning hand, which he was no longer able to ignore. Since that day she had strained over the brass railing of the car to hold him in her sight until the curtain of dust intervened, he had felt her call urging him into the west, the strength of her beckoning hand drawing him the way she had gone, to search the world for her and find her on some full and glorious day. I was aiming to sell whetstone and go on the train, Duke. No, I'm not going to sell him yet a while. The Duke was not a talkative man on any occasion, and now he sat in silence, watching the cook kneading out a batch of bread, his thoughts a thousand miles away. Where, indeed, would the journey that he was shaping in his intention that minute carry him? Somewhere along the railroad between there and the Puget Sound, the beckoning lady had left the train. Somewhere on that long road between mountain and sea, she was waiting for him to come. Tatterleg stood at his loaves in the sun to rise for the oven, making a considerable rattling about the stove as he put in the fire. A silence fell. Lambert was waiting for his horse to rest a few hours, and waiting till he sent his dreams ahead of him, where his feet could not follow, save by weary roads and slow. Between misery and the end of that railroad at the western sea, there were many villages, a few cities, a passenger might alight from the Chicago flyer at any one of them, and be absorbed in the vastness like a drop of water in the desert plain. How was he to know where she had left the train, or whither she had turned afterward her journey, or where she lodged now? It seemed beyond finding out. Assuredly, it was a task too great for the life of youth, so effervescent in the score of time even though so long and heavy to those impatient dreamers who draw themselves onward by its golden chain to the cold, harsh facts of age. It was a foolish quest, a hopeless one. So reason said, romance and youth and a longing that he could not define, rose to confute the sober argument, flushed an eager violet scent, blowing before. Who could I tell? perhaps rash speculations, faint promises. The world was not so broad that two might never meet in it whose ways had touched for one heart-throb, and sundered again in a sigh. All his life he had been hearing that it was a small place, after all, was said. Perhaps, and who can tell? And so, galloping onward in the free lash of his ardent dreams— "'When was you aiming to start, Duke?' Tatterleg inquired, after a silence so long that Lambert had forgotten he was there. Uh, "'In about an hour.' "'I wasn't trying to hurry you off, Duke. My reason for asking you was because I thought maybe I might be able to go along with you a piece of the way. If you don't object to my kind of company.' "'Why, you're not going to jump the job, are you?' "'Yes, I've been thinking it over.' and I've made up my mind to draw my time to-night. If you'll put off going till morning, I'll start with you. We can travel together till our roads branch, anyhow. I'll be glad to wait for you, old feller. I didn't know which way. Wyoming, said Tatterleg, sighing. It's 
come back on me again. Well, feller has to rove and ramble, I guess. Tatterleg sighed, looking off westward with dreamy eyes. Yes, if he's got a girl pulling on his heart, said he. The duke started as if he had been accused, the secret read, his soul laid bare. He felt the blood burn in his face and mount to his eyes like a drift of smoke. But Tatterleg was unconscious of his sudden embarrassment. This flash of panic for the thing which the duke believed lay so deep in his heart no man could ever find it out and laugh at it or make gay over the scented romance. Tatterleg was still looking off in a general direction that was westward, a little south of west. "'She's in Wyoming,' said Tatterleg. "'Lady I used to rush out in the Great Bend, Kansas, a long time ago.' "'Oh,' said the Duke, relieved and interested. "'How long ago was that?' "'Oh, over four years,' said Tatterleg, "'as if it might have been a quarter of a century. "'Not very long, Tatterleg.' "'Yes, but a lot of fellows can court a girl in four years, Duke.' The Duke thought it over a spell. "'Yes, I reckon they can,' he loud. "'Did she ever write to you?' "'I guess I'm more to blame than she is on that, Duke. She did write, but I was kind of sour and dropped her. It's hard to get away from, though. It's uh, coming over me again. I might have uh, been married and settled down with that girl now, me and her running an oyster parlor in some good little railroad town. If it hadn't have been for a Welshman named Elwood, he was a stonecutter, that Elwood fellow was Duke, working on bridge basement in the Santa Fe. That feller told her I was married and had four children. He came between us and bust us up. Wasn't that, Henri? said the Duke feelingly. I was chef in a hotel where that girl worked, waiting table drawing down good money and saving it, too. But that darned Welshman got around her, and she growed cold. When she left Great Bend, she went to Wyoming to take a job. Lander was the town she wrote from. I can put my finger on it in a map with my eyes shut. I met her when she was leaving from the depot, dragging along her grip, and no Welshman in a mile of her to give her a hand. I went up and tipped my hat, but I never smiled. For I was sour over the way that girl had treated me. I just took hold of that grip and carried it to the depot for her and tipped my hat to her once more. You're a gentleman, whatever they say of you, Mr. Wilson, she said. She did? She did, Duke. You're a gentleman, Mr. Wilson, whatever they say of you, she said. Then was her words, Duke. Farewell to you, I said, distant and I am mighty, for I was hurt, Duke. I was hurt right down to the bone. Bet you was, old feller. Farewell to you, I says, and tears come in her eyes, and she says to me, wiping em on a handkerchief, I give her nothing any Welshman ever done for her, and you can bank on that, Duke. She says to me, I'll always think of you as a gentleman, Mr. Wilson. I wasn't on to what that Welshman told her then. I didn't know the straight of it till she wrote and told me, after she got to Wyoming. It's too bad, old feller. Wasn't it hell? I was so sore when she wrote, the way she'd believed that little sawed-off snorter with rock dust in his hair. I never answered that letter for a long time. Well, I got another letter from her about a year after that. She was still in the same place, doing well, and her name was Nettie Morrison. Maybe it is yet, Tatterleg. Maybe I've been a-thinking I'll go out there and look her up. And if she ain't married, me and her might let bygones be bygones and hitch. I could open an oyster parlor out there on the dough I've saved up. I'd dish em up, and she'd wait on the table and take in the money. We'd do well, Duke. I bet you would. I got the last letter she wrote. I'll let you see it, Duke. Tatterleg made a rummaging in the chuck wagon, coming out presently with the letter. He stood contemplating it with tender eye. Some writer, ain't she, Duke? She sure is a fine writer, Tatterleg. Writes like a schoolmarm. She can talk like one, too. See, Lander, Y.O. That's a little town about as big as my hat from the looks of it on the map. Standing away off up there alone. 
I could go in it with my eyes shut, straight as a bee. Why don't you write to her, Tatterleg? The Duke could scarcely keep back a smile. So diverting he found this affair of the Welshman, the waitress, and the cook. More comedy than romance, he thought. Tatterleg on one side of the fence, that girl on the other. I've been a square enough to write, Tatterleg replied, but I don't seem to get the time. He opened his vest to put the letter away close to his heart. It seemed that it might remind him of his intention and square him quite around to the task. But there was no pocket on the side covering his heart. Tatterleg put the letter next to his lung as the nearest approach to that sentimental portion of his anatomy, and sighed long and loud as he buttoned his garment. "'You said you'd put off going till tomorrow morning, Duke?' "'Sure I will.' I'll throw my things in a sack and be ready to hit the breeze with you after breakfast. I can write back to the boss for my time. Morning found them on the road together, the sun at their backs. Tatterleg was as brilliant as a hummingbird, even to his belt and scabbard, which had a great many silver tacks driven into them, repeating the letters L.W. in great characters and small. He said the letters were the initials of his name. Lawrence? the Duke ventured to inquire. Tatterleg looked round him with a great caution before answering, although they were at least fifteen miles from camp, and further than that from the next human habitation. He lowered his voice, rubbing his hand reflectively along the glittering ornaments of his belt. Lovelace, he said. Not a bad name. Ain't no name for a cook, Tatterleg said almost vindictively. You're the first man ever told it to, and I'll ask you not to pass it on. I used to go by the name of Larry before they called me Tatterleg. Got that name out here in the Badlands. Suits me all right. It's a queer kind of a name to call a man by. How did they come to give it to you? Well, sir, I give myself that name, you might say, when you come to figure it down to cases. I was breaking a horse when I first come out here four years ago, heading at that time for Wyoming. He throwed me. When I didn't hop him again, the boys come over to see if I was busted. When they ask me if I was hurt, I says, Snap my darn old leg like a tater. And from that day on, they call me Tater Leg. Yes, and I guess I'd have been in Wyoming now, maybe with an oyster parlor and a wife, if it hadn't been for that blame horse. Paused reminiscently, then he said, Where was you aiming to camp tonight, Duke? Where does the flyer stop after it passes misery going west? Stops for water at Glendora, about fifty or fifty-five miles west. Sometimes I heard him say if a fellow buys a ticket for there in Chicago, it'll let him off, but I don't guess it stops there regular. Why, Duke, was you aiming to take the flyer there? No, we'll stop there tonight, then, if your horse can make it. Make it? If he can't, I'll eat him raw. He's made seventy-five many a time before today. So they fared on that first day in friendly converse. At sunset, they drew up on a mesa high above the treeless, broken country through which they had been riding all day, and saw Glendora in the valley below them. There she is, said Taterleg. I wonder what we're going to run into down there. End of chapter 5